Veliki pozdrav svim gledalcima Arene Fight. Nalazimo se u restoranu Sava Nova. Moj današnji gost je, mogu slobno da kažem, ikona mnogih legenda svetskog boksa, šampionu četiri različite divizije, legendarni Roy Jones Jr. Roy, welcome back to Belgrade. Thank you, brother. Glad to be back. Yeah, it's good to be back. Welcome back to the city that always welcomes you. So, you were here two years ago. Yep. What changed? Nothing. I mean, I love it. Everything's been great. I mean, I've enjoyed myself. Um, the tournaments they put on here were first class, so I really enjoyed it and I'm glad to be back. You came visited Belgrade two years ago during the World Championships. Yeah. It was two years ago. Now, in April, next year, Belgrade is going to host European Championship and it's going to be the first championship that uh, is going to contain men and women fights all together. So, what's your opinion about that? I think it's a beautiful thing, especially being that they're trying to take boxing out of the Olympics. I think this is a great way to start to keep that tradition going and it's a great way to move forward in boxing because when we're all together, it makes it much harder for everybody to pick us apart. We separate the men and separate the women and it's all boxing, but separate. Now it's easy for them to attack the women first, then attack the men next. So if you keep it together, it's hard to attack the whole sport. As you probably heard, Belgrade is going to get the new uh, national training center for, for boxers. So how it is important for young boxers to have a great uh, development center? It's very important because without development, how can they get to be professionals or be world champions like, like myself? If I didn't have a place to start, how could I finish? So if you don't start the race, how are you going to finish the race? And if your starting conditions are horrible, you may not, who knows, you may not make it. But if you got good starting conditions, it betters your chances to be successful in the end. So you told right now about the beginnings. So can you tell more about your beginnings? How it was? Uh, how you decided to, to start, firstly, the amateur career yeah. after the months of... of... Okay, my, my beginnings were I watched Muhammad Ali box when I was about five years old. I think it was 74, him and Joe Frazier. And my dad was very intrigued by it. So it made me want to box. So when I got 10, my father started training me. And uh, we trained in the backyard of my, my house. Then as I got about 14, we moved to a boys club. And started training at the boys club. And from there, I just took off. Can you tell us more about that relationship at the beginnings? In the beginning, me and my dad had a pretty good relationship. It's just that my dad was very uh, disciplinarian. He was, much, he was so much of a disciplinarian that he really didn't want me to make the same mistakes that he made, which was good for me because when you go try to do something and you fail, you know usually why you failed. So he had already tried it, and he knew why he wasn't successful. So he wanted to make sure I didn't go down the same road that he went down. So it was very difficult, but, you know, it, it was what it took, because look what happened. And that made his offer, yeah? It paid off. It paid off, and uh, we have seen that great amateur career. You won the two Golden Gloves in, in, in America. I won, I won the National Junior Olympics in 1984. Yeah. I won National Gold Gloves in 86, I won National Gold Gloves again in 87. In two different divisions, yeah? 139 and one, actually it's crazy. I won the Junior Olympics at 119, featherweight. I mean, bantamweight, bantamweight. bantamweight yeah. Then I won uh, National Gold Gloves at super lightweight. Then I won the National Gold Gloves again next year later at super middle, at super welterweight. <laughs> so. so we need to come back to 1988 and the Seattle yeah. Olympics. Yeah. I know it's tough to talk about that, Not about really. that about finals. Because uh, you went to the final without any lost round. Yep. And the domestic boxer from, from South Korea, and in the eyes of everyone that, that watched that game, that, that match, you won. But the decision was really controversial, and, and you got the silver. Yeah, it's crazy because nowadays, in every sport, they have a video playback. Football game, they stop the game, they play it back to make sure they get it right. Every sport has a playback now. But mine was live right then. Why couldn't we go change that? You understand me? They got swimming, they do playback. They do playback in almost everything now. So why can't we go to the video and play it back and see what really, we know what happened. You understand me? So well, it's crazy, but you know, it's life. That probably was a great thing for me though. And I understood why God did it to me. Because I was the person that when you knock me back, it just makes me go harder going forward again. So if you tell me no, that means yeah. So when they denied me the silver medal, I mean the gold medal, it made me go hard as a pro. So if I had got a gold medal, I guarantee you, I never would have became heavyweight champ of the world. You understand me? Because I would have been satisfied, complacent. I would have been on medium like I was. But since I didn't get the gold, I got silver, 
Now I got a point to prove. So I turned it on high. And I went from junior middleweight. I turned professional as a junior middleweight, just like I won in the Olympics. Junior middleweight, and when I only person ever to turn professional as a junior middleweight and become heavyweight champ of the world. Only person ever. Yeah, the only one boxer in history that started with junior middleweight and, and then did the heavyweight. Yeah. Uh, what made you to switch classes so easily? It wasn't about switching classes. When they robbed me of that gold medal, I, and I got the Val Barker Cup, which means I was the best fighter at the Olympics. That's true, but the best fighter at the Olympics without a gold medal. It's only you. you understand me? You, yeah. So now I got to go prove to y'all why I was the best, fight, best fighter at the Olympics. I got to prove to y'all that, yeah, they robbed me, and they knew it. That's why they gave me the best boxer, because they knew I was the best boxer there. And to show it, I'm going to go show y'all how much I can do to prove that I was the best boxer there. And you were, you were the boxer of the decade at that time. Yep. And just one more question about the Olympics. Uh, you told earlier that uh, you had a conversation with Park. What did he told you after the fight? He said he knew he didn't win, but it was his decision, but he knew he didn't win. And after that, I was okay. I said, okay. And I shook his hand and I walked away because if you admit to me that you know you lost, you didn't make the decision, the judge did. So I shook his hand because he honestly know, he said, I, I, know, I know I didn't win. I didn't make the decision. I'm, res I'm respectful of that. So do you have now respect for him after that talk? Anytime a man can admit when he's wrong, and he wasn't wrong because he didn't do it, but he knew what, what happened to him and what happened to me was wrong. And I came to find out later in my life that it did more damage to his life than it did to my life. They gave him my gold medal and it ruined his life. And I'm sorry for him because I didn't do it. I, I was res the recipient of a bad decision too. And I think people didn't understand that giving him that medal was going to make his life the way it made it. So after that, we told you that you're the only one in history that went from the junior middleweight to the heavyweight title. So, of course, it's, it's uh, difficult in heavyweight, but uh, what uh, weight class suits you most? Super middleweight. Super middleweight. Yeah. Super middleweight, I was, I was small, but that's about, about my area. The guys were probably closer to my size, for real, my natural size. And uh, it was good, but at light heavy, all the guys came from over 200 pounds to make light heavy. I walked around at 192, so I really wasn't a light heavyweight either. You understand me? So super middle, I probably was best because the super middle, I walked around, like I said, 192, and made super middle, that was pretty good. You won the heavyweight title against uh, John Royce, and it was spectacular. You were weighing like 88 kilos, you were the lightest one ever. <laughs> yeah. And uh, can you tell us, after that, the media started rumors uh, you're going to fight against Lennox Lewis, against Evander Holyfield, against Mike Tyson, and that never happened at that time. The problem was, what they didn't understand was, I already went to ask Holyfield to fight him before I fought Ruiz. Holyfield said no. Ruiz then beat Holyfield, and he said, I'll fight Roy Jones. That's why I fought him. So I told him, I'll fight Ruiz after I win the title, the only other heavyweight I want to fight is Mike Tyson. If Mike Tyson say no, then I'll go back and recapture the light heavyweight title, then I'll retire. I went back and recapture, Mike Tyson said no. I went back and recapture the light heavyweight title, and I should have retired. Had I retired, right now we wouldn't even be talking about it. I, and and truth we still shouldn't be talking about it because in my prime, I didn't lose rounds. They have never had a fighter that was as, as dominant as me in my prime to this day. You understand me? Not with the skill set. Tyson was dominant, but not with the skill set I had. You understand me? So it's like, in every other sport, once you get older, they don't look at that. They look at what you did in your prime. They judge you by what, from what you did in your prime. Why can't I not be judged by what I did in my prime? Because in my prime, nobody can touch me. Can be judged. That's your... Simple. The song says it. The song says it, yeah. And, like you said, in life, we can count, we talking about, Living boxes and dead boxes. There's no boxer ever to turn pro as a junior middleweight and become heavyweight champion of the world. How can I not be pound for pound the best in my prime? Let's talk more about Tyson. Fight never happened at that time. But uh, you were boxing until uh, 2018. You went to retirement. But in 2020, 
the offer came and you accepted the fight with Mike Tyson. It was an exhibition fight. Yes. And how it was uh, your training camp after the two and a half years of... of crazy cause, it was crazy because it was hard to really get going like that. But because I wanted to fight him in, back when I was world heavyweight champ, I was like, I still want to see what this would have been like. So when he called me and said he wanted to do an exhibition, I'm like, I don't want to, but for him, I will because I, I knew I wanted to fight him back in the day. So I said, why not go do it? So I did it. It was really, really fun. Uh, he was strong like I thought it would be, and he's still just as strong as he was then. The one thing that got me was it was a little bit more difficult to hit him when he does that side to side than I thought it would be. I was like, okay. You know, he would, that, that would have threw me up for a loop for a round or two, but after that, I was good. So after that, uh, like two years ago, you gave an interview to my colleague Katarina and you told her that you're not coming back in the ring. But in April, we saw you against Anthony Pettis. So can I something? Well, let me tell you what happened. So last, before that, I was training Chris Eubank Jr. He lost to Liam Smith. But making weight is where I think he really lost the fight at. So he did the water, the, uh, the, uh, the, the salt bath, and pulled out the last few pounds. And I thought it drained his legs. I thought. So when they asked me would I fight Pettis, I said, you know, I don't really want to box no more. I really don't want to box like that. But I was 225 pounds. The fight was at 200. I had six weeks. I said, this is giving me a chance to do two things. I can water load for the last week, add water to my body, then let it all go out at the end, which is something new that they do. I didn't do that when I was in my prime. And if I have a problem at the end, I can try the salt bath, so now I can explain it to the guys when I'm training them how to do it. I said, wow, that'll, that'll make me a better trainer. So for once in my life, I took a fight not to become a better fighter, but to become a better trainer. And I thought I won the fight still. But I came from 225 at 54 years old. Went all the way down to 199. I did water loading and I did the salt bath. So now when I tell my fighters, when my fighters want to do it, I know how. When Chris you ain't did it, I wasn't, I didn't know how because I had never done it before. That's not how I used to make weight. You feel me? It's just time change. So I took that fight to bring myself up to speed with the making weight process because it's new. It ain't new now, but for me it was new and it's different. And it's actually, it's actually a lot more efficient because you don't wear yourself out as bad. You mentioned your coaching career. Can you tell us something more about that? How it feels? How it feels to be outside of the ring in the corner? Is it more stressful? Some fighter says it is very stressful to be. It's crazy. It's crazy because for me coaching, I get more nervous for my fighters than I did when I fought. Good question, yeah. When my guys are fighting, I'm more scared and nervous for them than when I'm fighting. I'm fighting now. <laughs> Let's go. But when they find out, oh gosh, bite my finger, I don't, I don't know, I'd be, I be wigged out, <laughs> worried about my fighters, you understand me? So it's like, it's crazy, but I get way more nervous as a trainer than I ever thought about being as a fighter. But you enjoy it. Oh, I love it. What's next for you? Can we expect you in the ring? Uh, One well, more time. It's crazy, it's crazy, it's crazy. I was in Saudi Arabia at the Fury fight, Fury and Gunner. And John Fury said he wanted to fight Mike Tyson. I said, wow, if they do that exhibition, why not me and Tommy Fury do the undercard, do the, do the co-main event? So I mentioned it to him. They were like, you know what? That's not a bad idea. So when I got home, I think the John and Tyson fight fell out that Tyson wanted to do it. I get home, they called me anyway and said, Tommy said he still want to fight you. I said, oh, gosh. I, what I stuck my foot in now. So now... Tommy Fury really does want to fight me. I don't know why. But, and, uh, and for some reason, the Saudis, because they love spending money and love get, doing big things, they want to see legendary fights. So they want to see myself and Anderson Silva still because me and Anderson Silva was supposed to be the first crossover real boxing match before even Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor. We would want to come with the concept. The UFC wouldn't let Anderson do it when he was on top. But they let kind of do it. So. You're the one who called the data and told you want to fight the silver. Of course. Of course. But they never would let him do it. 
Uh, you mentioned the fight with Tyson with, uh, with Ngannou, Fury with Ngannou. Yeah. So how it was in Arabia? There are many of legends. So. Yeah, a lot of legends. It was one of the best events I've ever been to as far as legends go. Uh, I don't think I've ever been in a, at an event with that many legendary champions at one time. So many guys. Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, Mike Tyson. I mean, you name it, they were there. Only, only two people that probably wasn't there was Tommy Hearns, the Klitschko brothers, and maybe Floyd and Bernard Hopkins. But those guys are, you know, they a little bit different. But to be amongst that great group of champions, it was awesome for me. How did you like the fight? And uh, what do you think about Ngannou's career? I thought Ngannou did a great job. Um, I'm still not sure about his career because Tyson completely underestimated him. And uh, Tyson Fury that is, so I'm not, that doesn't mean that he can have a great career as a boxer. We're going to see, we got to see him a couple more times, see how he fares with guys who won't underestimate him, guys who will come in actually afraid of him because of his MMA career and because of his size. So these guys are going to fight him a little different. Uh, Tyson Fury thought that because he was an MMA fighter, he had a big advantage first of all, then he thought secondly because of his height, he didn't think Ngannou would be able to make the adjustments. I was totally surprised because Ngannou not only made the adjustments, but because he did so well, not that he necessarily won on points, but he deserved the victory that day. Roy, that's probably it. So thank you so much for the interview, and can you send, for the, can you send some message for your fans in Serbia, but you have many. Um, all my fans in Serbia, thank you guys. I'm so glad to be back here again. I really love it here. I enjoy my life here. I enjoy the time I spent here. And if y'all open the gym, I, I will guarantee you guys that I will come over some and serve as a trainer to give y'all some of these Roy Jones dream maneuvers. All right? Peace by the head in the building. Thanks a lot, Roy. Thank you. Pošto je gledalci, bio je to Roy Jones Jr. Kao što ste čuli, je to mala ekskluziva, obići će i koje sale, tako da svi na trening budite redovni, možda baš vas obiđe Roy Jones. Hvala što ste bili uz nas i ostanite uz Arena Fight. What up? It's your boy Roy Jones Jr. I just want to say Merry Christmas to all my fans at Arena Fight TV. Hope y'all have a good one.